Okay, thank you, welcome. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about layer, but at the last possible moment I decided to change my presentation a bit because what I'm really going to do today is give yet another history lesson. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, actually a, a teacher of history, so I know what I'm doing, and you uh, will like it. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the history of web development, though I will start as advertised with the layer tag. Um, who here has actually worked with the layer tag back in, back in the day? Oh, a few. Uh, explain the youngsters what they missed, because they miss a lot. I mean, this was the day of Netscape 4. Um, if you're complaining about browsers today, I think, oh, you're such, such a sweet guy. I mean, you don't, don't even remember Netscape 4. While we are all stars who really remember Netscape 4, we know what real browser incompa incompatibility looks like. Um, layer back then was basically what we now call an absolutely positioned element. Um, although Netscape decided to do it differently. And one of the problems uh, was that you cannot really change anything about the layer except for its, its position. That was called DHTML back in the day, and you could uh, kind of move an element from left to right or from top to bottom over the screen. And that was wonderful back in the day because we didn't have such a thing yet. Nowadays, it's considered, you know, standard, but this is where it all started. Of course, Netscape 4 had its share of bugs. Uh, about the old, uh, the old timers in the audience will certainly remember the reflow bug. If you resized a uh, Netscape 4 window, it would re recalculate the entire flow of the page very slowly. And first making the screen blank, and then restarting the layout of the page. Those were the days. Of course, uh, absolutely positioned elements in IE worked a lot better. Um, if you remember all of this, and there's a few people in the audience who do, you also remember most of the history of web development. And that's what I'm really going to talk about that. Uh, because I think there are certain lessons to be drawn from it. And also because I think that no, uh, not everybody appreciates some of the subtler things that have happened to us web developers in the past 15 years. And it all starts with layer. Um, before I really start, uh, I want to give uh, one warning. This, uh, this whole theory of mine is still a work in progress. Um, when I finish this presentation, you won't have a triumphant conclusion where everything clicks together and everybody thinks, oh, that PPK is really a smart guy. It's more like questions. It's more like, think about this. It's more like, we have these ingrained habits, and maybe it's time to do something about it. So it all started with the browser wars, which, uh, for those of you who didn't live through, uh, uh, through them, um, one of the most important uh, things about the browser wars is that it featured a unique set of browser incompatibilities, the deliberate incompatibilities. Back then, and I'm talking about 1998 now, uh, Netscape and IE, which were, in fact, the only two browsers, there was Opera, but it came in a little later, and it was always fairly small. But Netscape and IE um, were deliberately incompatible with one another. Why? Because they hoped to gain market share in that way. They hoped that their way of web development would help get web developers to their platform so that they would develop only for Netscape or only for IE. Um, and the unintended consequence was uh, that uh, web developers started to learn, oh, it's okay if I test in only one browser, because the other browser works very differently, and um, I'm not going to bother with it, which gave rise to the dreaded best viewed in, like this ancient, ancient site. It's called from uh, Dynamic Duo, which was uh, really a thing back in 1998. Um, my browser is not good enough because I must have Netscape 4.0 or IE 4.0 to run any of the examples on this site. And this is the first and maybe the worst habit we acquired. We have to test in only one browser because the rest is not good enough anyway. Or our users don't use those browsers. Or um, basically I can't be bothered, I'm lazy. And this is a very bad habit that we're in the process of breaking um, but I think uh, it needs a, a little more energy there. 
Um, best field in still exists. It's not important anymore, but um, I came across this site from the Provincial Infection Control Network of British Columbia. I had no idea it even existed. But they seem to have run a uh, contest, possibly a photo contest, and they say, best viewed in Google Chrome. We're actually viewing it in Firefox right now. And it looks kind of crappy, but that's because it's kind of a crappy site. There is no difference whatsoever between Firefox and Chrome. I tested it on this particular page. So why do they say best viewed in Chrome? Probably because they were afraid. Probably because their manager told them, oh, your website should be pixel perfect in, in, in every browser. And they said, oh, we can't make that. Okay, make it only Chrome. Something like that. Silly reasons in any case. Uh, to their credit, uh, Google combats this aggressively. So I'm very glad about that. Uh, back in the day, of course, Netscape and Microsoft loved the idea of uh, incompatible websites that would only work on their browser. Nowadays, uh, that's uh, completely out of fashion. And Google, being the most important browser vendor today, pushes back aggressively against uh, this sort of nonsense, which is good. Then peace broke out. Uh, I.e. won the browser wars. We all know that, but sometimes we forget that it, that is simply because I.E. was the better browser back in that day. Who here remembers first setting eyes on I.E. 6 when it was just released? Yeah. It was an amazing browser. I mean, uh, there was this guy who did uh, Microsoft Technologies at the company I worked uh, in, and he got an early uh, preview release, and he called me and said, yeah, yeah, come look at this browser. This is the new I.E. And I thought, wow, this is really a great browser. Um, this teaches us two lessons. First of all, the whole best viewed in thing was reinforced, because if uh, Microsoft has a really great browser, why bother with uh, Netscape 4 at all? And the second lesson is yesterday's wonderful browser is today's junk. Though I must uh, add to that that uh, um, the way IE6 became junk has never uh, been repeated in uh, web development history. I mean, uh, uh, about a year ago, there was something like Safari is the new IE6, Safari iOS, that is. And I didn't really agree with that. I mostly thought, oh, these people don't know what they're talking about. IE6 was really bad at the end. But it was really wonderful when it came out. Um, what we also saw in the, the, the HTML days was the first wave of tooling, because in order to combat browsing incompatibilities, you need tools. I mean, this is, not, uh, uh, this is a statement of fact, uh, and it uh, makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And it's, in fact, uh, this is one of the reasons I started quirksmode.org, um, because back then it was impossible to find reliable uh, compatibility information between Netscape 4 and IE4. There were these articles that said, oh, yeah, it's wonderful in Netscape, oh, yeah, it's wonderful in IE, but how do you combine the two? Uh, I couldn't find anything, so I decided to create my own site. And that led, among others, to Dynamic Drive, which I think is the very first JavaScript library ever. Who remembers Dynamic Drive? Ah, yes, the old days, you know. Wonderful. Um, not so wonderful, to be honest. But still, um, we acquired a new habit to use tools to work around incompatibilities. And the first habit we acquired, you know, about testing in only one browser is just bad. This one is more of a mixed bag. Uh, in principle, it makes sense, but there's also dangers involved. I'm going to get back to tools later in this presentation. So, <coughs> what I also think, and what's generally underappreciated is uh, that there was a sec second factor in our tool use back then and now as well. Um, the idea that real programmers use tools and they follow rules and stuff. Um, they look down on us and we look up to them because, you know, back in the day we were just a bunch of script kiddies, you know, and it's HTML. HTML is simple, right? It's actually not. You will see that later today. But it's thought to be simple. And this uh, created a tension that has been uh, unresolved until this day, and we acquired a new habit. We feel inferior to real programmers, and we start to compensate for that. One final example from Dynamic Drive, this function. I actually remember it from those days, because I thought, what kind of nonsense is this? It actually existed in that library. Uh, and if you say this is about browser compatibility, it's not, because document.body was supported even in Netscape 3 and maybe even in Netscape 2, but I am not quite sure about that. But Netscape 3 certainly. 
This is the kind of nonsense uh, that comes with uh, emulating real programmers. We'll get back to that. Then something extremely important happened, and that's the standards revolution. Who here remembers WASP, the Web Standards Project? Not everybody. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. That knowledge is kind of slipping away from us. Um, very briefly, uh, in, I think it was 1998, uh, a bunch of web developers, uh, mainly US-based, uh, led by Jeffrey Zeltman, said, you know, this whole incompatibility is nonsense. Uh, we have uh, web standards, and browsers should just follow the web standards. And back then, that meant uh, both Netscape and IE should uh, radically change their rendering engine in order to follow the web standards. And it took a while. It took a lot of talking. It took a lot, lot of convincing. But in the end, this was a successful endeavor. Uh, from that moment on, all browsers are supposed to support the web standards. And, you know, there are still uh, problems here and there, but the fundamental principle uh, is uh, still the same uh, today as it was then. You ought to follow the web standards. That's cool. However, WASP had a kind of an unintended side effect as well, and nobody ever talks about that. Because what WASP really was, was the first time that web developers took action in their own right. The first time that web developers say, uh, said, okay, we web developers, um, we see a problem, nobody else is interested in that problem, so we are going to solve that ourselves. And in hindsight, that uh, created a watershed moment that's underappreciated. Um, basically, what we did is create our own ecosystem. And we had to do that completely by ourselves, as freelancers, as owners of small businesses, as um, web developers who work for large uh, institutions such as universities, because nobody else cared. Even the browser vendors at the very start didn't really care about WASP and about all that it tried to do. And uh, other big companies certainly did not care, except for Adobe a little bit because of Dreamweaver. Um, and this um, requirement to create our own ecosystem has had both good and bad consequences. Uh, the good one, uh, one of the good ones, is conferences, like this one. I don't know about you, but I've been to a few generic software conferences, and they are quite different from uh, web development conferences as we know them. Um, and that is not a coincidence because uh, web development conferences such as this one are organized by actual web developers because they want to share knowledge, because they want to get their peers together in one room to talk about nerdy stuff. And that is not all that usual in uh, other software conferences. Besides, um, I get the distinct impression that the average speaker at a web conference is better than the average speaker at a software conference. Again, that is no coincidence, because certainly in the early days, um, web conferences weren't really able to pay their speakers. Uh, and besides, uh, big companies weren't interested in web conferences yet, so they didn't actually send out people uh, to talk at them. So um, the web speakers, were basically recruited uh, because they were good speakers. And that has remained a uh, thing up until this day. So the uh, one of the consequences of creating our own ecosystem is that our conferences are somewhat unlike other software conferences, which is interesting. There are also bad consequences. Impenetrable jargon, mostly. Um, this was two or three weeks ago, I saw one of these interminable dis discussions. Pseudo-class, pseudo-class, it's a pseudo-element, you fool. Um, it's all nonsense. I mean, um, it may be technically true, but it scares uh, people away from web development, and that's why I object to it. Another problem I'm having is with progressive enhancements. Uh, not with the concept, I absolutely adore the concept, and I wish we uh, would do a better job of actually doing progressive enhancement, but I think the term is becoming laden. The term is becoming a kind of a shorthand uh, for unrealistic hippies who ask for stuff they're not going to get anyway as seen from outside the web development community, right? So, um, basically, we acquired a habit of looking inwards, because nobody understood us anyway. And if that sounds a bit like puberty, uh, that's intended. 
because I think we entered puberty uh, as web developers back, uh, in, say, around the end of the WASP in two, uh, 2002, 2003, and it's time to snap out of it and become grown-ups. Then came the app revolution. And not all people re uh, realize that the app revolution actually started before the mobile revolution. Initially, the app revolution was not about mobile app, but apps, but about desktop apps. Because roughly in the time frame 2006 to 2008, we started to find out that we could emulate uh, native apps, desktop apps, um, in a browser. And the most important example of that is, of course, Google Docs, which uh, t took on Microsoft Office and turned out to be good enough. Not as good as Microsoft Office, but if you remember your disruption th uh, theory, you also know that uh, a disruptive uh, force only has to be good enough for people to use it. And it doesn't have to be an exact copy of whatever it's going to replace. <coughs> um, now, this was great for web developers, but it uh, also created another problem. Because uh, this was the mindset we had, like, okay, in the browser we can emula emulate pretty much any app we want. This was the mindset we had when uh, the iPhone came out and when the mobile revolution started. We thought, okay, there will be native apps, but we can do better anyway in the browser. There's no problem there. In general, that has turned out not to be the case. And um, the problem here is that our, um, our priorities are still um, being defined in this whole context of doing as well as native apps. And that I, is something I forcefully objected to uh, last year. I said that we should stop trying to emulate native apps. I said, uh, said it might be time to have a moratorium on new browser features for a while. Now that was a discussion worth having. And it's not actually going to happen, and I never actually thought it was going to happen, but it, you know, it was to stir up a discussion. Because I think our uh, uh, priorities are wrong right now. In any case, we acquired a nasty new habit, habit of uh, comparing browsers to things that are not browsers. And I object to that as well, because a browser is a browser, and a not a browser is a not a browser, and there's absolutely no point in comparing them. But still, we want to measure browser success uh, based on how well it emulates native apps nowadays. And this, I think, is a serious problem that we have to address as well. Quick te technical detour. Why will web apps never be as good as native apps? It's extremely simple. Um, if you build a native app, you communicate directly with the underlying operating system, right? Apple and Google have created native APIs, and you as a developer can call on them to, you know, re-render the screen, or scroll left, or zoom in, or do whatever you like. And the native app tells the operating system to do it, and it happens. Web apps don't work quite the same because there's an intermediate layer, the browser. Web apps communicate with the browser, and the browser communicates with the operating system. And of course, we all try to make that as fast as possible, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but the fundamental problem here is that there is an intermediate layer. That's good in one respect, compatibility. We can uh, uh, create one single web app or website or ha however you want to call it and be reasonably certain that it works on all browsers. But the disadvantage is that everything will take slightly longer. And oh, everything will be slightly coarser, slightly more grainier because uh, sometimes uh, web apps uh, are just a little bit slower than native. And um, this is the whole uh, technical background to why web apps can never be as good as native apps. And to me, it's really simple, but people refuse to see it for some reason. I don't know. People are strange. Okay, let's go to the mobile revolution proper. iPhone, 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 you know? Um, there were three kind of new things that we learned as web developers when the mo mobile revolution came along. First of all, screen sizes, screen resolutions. There are many, many more uh, now than there were back then. And we had to say goodbye forever um, to the best viewed in 1280 pixels because it had to work on an iPhone. Because I've got an iPhone and you've got an iPhone and all my friends and colleagues have an iPhone, so it must work on the iPhone. Other phones, 
there are no other phones but the iPhone, but it has to work on the iPhone. It's really, really, really important that it works on the iPhone. This was actually good because it forced to th uh, us to think outside the box. The second thing that changed is, is that nowadays there are many, many more browsers than ever. Um, if you li uh, I've listened to a few here. You see BlackBerry, Samsung Chromium, Opera Mini. Um, very brief detail, <coughs> what is Samsung Chromium? Um, what most people don't know is that when you buy an Android device, a Samsung, an HTC, a Lenovo, whatever, um, they have a default browser on it that's based on Chrome, but it's not actually Google Chrome. And they uh, branched um, usually an earlier version of Chrome and uh, changed it slightly and used that as a default browser. So uh, there is a Samsung Chromium. It's now at 44, Chromium 44. There's an HTC Chromium at 33. And there are many more. There is a list somewhere on my site. Uh, in any case, uh, this is something that we don't always realize. And my question uh, uh, to you is now, uh, of these browsers, you see BlackBerry, the Samsung uh, Internet Browser, and Opera Mini. How many of you test your sites from time to time on at least one of them? Quite a few. Okay. Okay. Better than I expected. Better than I expected. But we are not average web developers here, right? We are very wonderful web developers. Um, and the third thing that happened was uh, native apps and the desire to emulate them. We already talked about that. So, our solutions. Where? Responsive design, ignore browsers, and emulate, 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 emulate. Um, we can be uh, pretty brief about the browsers. Um, we see that our bad habit that we acquired back in the day, HTML day, still works today. Um, if we encounter a browser we do not know, we ignore it. I mean, something has changed since those days because we now pay attention to two browsers, Chrome, Google Chrome, and Safari, because both of them are important in the mobile space. We know that, but all the rest, who cares about Opera Mini? Who cares about UC? And there's only one Chrome. I mean, that whole thing about Samsung Chrome and HTC Chrome is just nonsense. That is what the average web developer thinks here. So this is a reinforcement of the ancient habit of testing in only one browser. What happened on the screen side of things is a lot more interesting responsive design. And res responsive design actually works, and that is great. But uh, you should realize that the reason that it works and that it has taken the uh, world by storm is that technically it's extremely simple. You put a meta viewport tag, tag in the page um, so that it uh, resizes the layout viewport to the ideal viewport so that it looks nice on the device it runs on. And then you use media queries to figure out what that actual width is and uh, change your design around a bit. This actually worked in all browsers. And because it did, and because it was technically very simple, we could immediately say, okay, this is not a technical problem anymore, it's a design problem. And we web developers are in some way are better equipped to handle design and usability problems than technical problems. Strange as that may sound. Because, you know, um, it also helped that the people who actually imp implemented the first, re uh, first responsive uh, web designs wanted to impress their colleagues who were on an iPhone. So, the mobile revolution uh, let us acquire a good habit, responsive design or caring about screen sizes. We've got that. We understand that, and that's really cool. If uh, responsive design had been uh, much more complicated technically, I think this would fall into the same category as progressive enhancement, something that's really, really good uh, in theory, but that few people do in practice. But because it's technically so simple, we could say, okay, we're just going to do it, and we're just going to make sure that our sites uh, look well on any sort of screen size. Um, concurrently with all these revolutions, we had the tool revolution. You all know the score. Every week, new libraries, frameworks, whatever, are being released. And to be honest, who cares anymore? Uh, except for the biggies, right? Uh, Angular, React, Ember, you probably have one or two other libraries that I should mention. This is one of the older slides in my uh, presentation, so it could be that I completely missed a new library. But remember that even those established libraries are pretty new as well and have their share of problems. See also Angular 1, which is a problem by itself. Um, 
I don't really care about 2x or 2y, but I, um, what I try to do is think about what are we doing with the tools. So we use tools for polyfills. We use it for MV star frameworks. Uh, by the way, where's there a star here, MV star? I have no clue either, but you absolutely have to put a star there, or nobody will take you seriously. UX libraries, dependency thingies. I'm starting to hate them because not always, but too often dependency means I'm too lazy to write it myself. That's going to be contentious, I know. Other thingies with weird names, snort, grumble, whatever, I don't care anymore. Uh, the real question is not, are these things useful? Because especially MVC frameworks and UX libraries, yes, they can be very useful indeed to your project. My main question is, why so many? Why such a huge amount of tools that's growing every day? And I think this goes back again to one of the bad habits uh, we picked up back in the, H the HTML uh, days. We want to show that web the app development is a serious thing with capitals, right? Serious thing. And serious developers use long tool chains. Um, one objection you could make is, okay, serious developers use long tool chains, but these tool chains are actually, uh, um, you know, a constant. They are being uh, slowly evolved over time, while uh, right now the JavaScript tool chain is in chaos because um, you see a new th thing happening every day. And nowadays, uh, you know, the, the hip tool to go to is React. In uh, about a year to a year and a half, there will be a new tool, blah, 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 blah. And that is a problem. Um, but it's, to me at least, it's not a fundamental problem. Because, say you are a Java developer, PHP, Perl, whatever, and you use a long tool chain, that tool chain runs on the server, which is absolutely fine by me. But if you use a long JavaScript tool chain, especially with all kinds of dependencies that have to be loaded, you force all your users to download and execute all your tools, even when they're on an old mobile phone on a crappy network. And that is the problem I have with tools nowadays. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you should not use tools. I'm saying you should think about how you use your tools. Anyway, this reinforced a new habit, use tools because serious programmers do it. Wonderful. Um, one more quote from uh, last uh, year's CSS day. Uh, John Daggett of, uh, of Mozilla then just made a quick remark during speaker's dinner. Yeah, modularization encourages overdesign. And I thought about it and said, yeah, he's right. If you write the perfect JavaScript tool, it should be able to perform in any number of circumstances, including edge cases. So you continue working on it and working on it and adding extra logic and extra stuff to help uh, the tool perform well in those edge cases. Um, and at a certain point, you cross uh, a line into completely over-designing your tool. And in itself, that's not so bad, but the browser also has to download and execute your entire tool. And that is the problem here. Um, all this led me to create the platonic image, if you want, of the true JavaScript. Now, the true JavaScript does use libraries and frameworks. I'm not saying you should not use them. I'm saying you should think about them. You should study them in detail and know what they're doing before you actually start using them. Um, <coughs> also, I think the true JavaScript prefers to use a single tool per project. And yes, that means making choices. Do I need an MVC framework or a UX library more for this project? It forces you to think. It forces you to make clear what the project is actually about. It forces you to think, okay, maybe this project is overly complicated. If I cannot do without both an MVC framework and the UX library, let's say you should ask some questions. And that's, again, I'm not saying that if you still use both after careful deliberation, you're doing it wrong, but think about your tool set. Think about what each tool is supposed to achieve. Finally, the true JavaScript is able to write a medium complex ap application without any tool whatsoever. Again, I'm not saying that this is something you should do in every single project, but I am saying that this is something you should do, say, every 10 to 12 projects. If you have a not too overly complicated project and you need the exercise, you say, okay, 
I'm going to do it without tools. Uh, I'm an exception to that rule. I have never used a tool in my life. I have absolutely no clue how they work, and I'm not really interested in it either. But that's because I don't do a lot of actual development work anymore. So your mileage may vary, and uh, you should definitely think about it. But at least in a side project, at least once, just write something without any tool whatsoever, because it will teach you such, such a lot. It will give you technical background. It will teach you what browsers can do to your code. It will teach you what's right and what's wrong. And it will teach you to evaluate the existing tools based on what they're actually doing. You know, uh, especially when it comes to DOM manipulation, which is a performance hell, um, you should be able to tell what uh, a framework is doing. See also Angular 1, which does it completely wrong. Um, um, this is an ideal you should strive for. It's not something you should start doing at your day job uh, next week. That's, of course, nonsense. But please think about this sort of stuff. Please try to create at least one project somewhere that doesn't use any tools whatsoever, and you will be amazed at how much you learn. Although the learning curve will, of course, be a lot steeper. But web development uh, learning curves are steep. Web development is not easy. And I think it's actually one of the hardest uh, things in uh, engineering right now. And I'll get back to the fundamental reason why that is the case. Let's put it a little stronger. If you can't do without tools, you're not a web developer. If you absolutely must have your tool chain and you are kind of hopeless without it, and you're completely lost and you have no clue what you're doing, then I'm wondering if you are a true web developer. Contentious, I know. Think about it. OK, so I promised you reasons. And it's time to talk about platforms, plural. Extremely important point, that plural. Um, as we've seen, web developers look at real programmers for guidance. And in a lot of cases, this is actually a good idea because uh, software engineering is uh, older than the web, and we can definitely learn a lot from experienced software engineers. However, I am starting to get the feeling that in some cases their guidance, their precepts, their ideas are wrong because the web is different from uh, other software engineering uh, disciplines in one crucial respect. And the problem here is not so much that we don't understand it, but rather that the people we look to for guidance don't always understand that. I'm sure you've seen this quote before. Browsers are the most hostile development platforms in the world. It was by Douglas Crockford. It's ages old, maybe 10 years old by now. And he is, of course, completely right. But I've started to misquote Douglas. I'm starting to say browsers are the most misunderstood development platforms in the world. Because there's one thing that is just different from browsers on the, un uh, on the one hand to basically any other sort of uh, development platform on the other hand. Um, I think that is the reason why back-end developers underestimate the web platform and front-end development. The web is not one platform. The web is a multitude of platforms, and you won't test on most of them. Here, I've got an HTC M8, and it has the HTC Chromium 33 default browser. If I were to buy an HTC M9, which is the upgrade of this model, with the same HTC Chromium 33 default browser, technically speaking, this would be a different web platform. The differences aren't huge, but I'm fa uh, fairly certain that you will find at least one difference uh, if you look carefully. And this is a problem, especially since the mobile revolution, there are just way too many combinations of devices and browser. You cannot test in all of them. I mean, fortunately, I learned that uh, about six years ago uh, when I worked at Vodafone for a while testing uh, mobile browsers for the first time. And I started there with the idea of, okay, now I'm going to make a list of all mobile browsers, and then I'm going to test them all and put it in neat compatibility tables on my site, etc. <coughs> that didn't work. There were just way too many of them. And I think this is the fundamental thing that 
maybe even some web developers, but certainly a lot of non-web developers don't understand about the web, um, you're, you just don't know what you're going to get. You can get a latest Chrome on Mac, but you could also get an outdated version of UC on a very vague Chinese Android that nobody really knows anything about. But your website should still kind of work in both circumstances. Um, um, I also think that the reason that at least some back-end developers don't really understand this is because they are too used to uh, working for a predefined platform, or maybe a few, say four, five, six platforms, uh, but not much more than that. And they know what they're getting into. And, you know, especially if you uh, uh, write uh, big enterprise software in Java or something, you start out with defining, okay, what it's going to run on. And, you, yeah, you know, you have to haggle with your manager, or oh, could we please have this software package, and could we please have one server extra, blah, blah, blah. You go back and forth, but in the end, you have defined what your software is going to run on. That whole concept doesn't exist on the web. But still, they expect the web to be the same. They have to learn JavaScript, of course, obviously. The web uses JavaScript and not another programming language. So they will learn JavaScript, and they will be amazed at the amount of tools they have. And they think, oh, these tools solve browser incompatibilities for us, and uh, they are created by big companies, so they must be good, which is not always the case. See Angular 1. <clears throat> Um, there is a mismatch here. Um, and the real problem is not so much that ba uh, backenders who are fresh to front and don't uh, quite understand the web, because it is difficult to understand if you've never encountered it. The problem is partly with us frontenders who don't explain this more powerfully, who don't, uh, don't say, okay, the web is not one platform, it's a multitude of platform platforms. What didn't help was a few years ago, there was this whole to talk about the one web. Now, we web developers understand what that means. We web developers understand that that means, okay, um, if you create a website, it may behave slightly differently in uh, different browsers, but in the end, everybody should be able to access it, which is, of course, true. But we shouldn't call it the one web because it confuses the hell out of non-web developers. They think, okay, there's one platform. Oh, there's JavaScript that I have to learn. Uh, yeah, I will uh, learn JavaScript. Oh, it doesn't have object orientation. Oh, naughty, naughty JavaScript. You don't understand anything. But, of course, we can use a tool to work around that and get proper object-oriented stuff. And then we have CSS. Um, ah, you know we're going to hire somebody for the CSS. But it's not important anyway because it's not a programming language. That sort of thing, that mindset, it's a mindset I uh, object to and not necessarily um, the actual flow of such a project. The web is fundamentally different from uh, all other platforms. Um, one example that I um, discovered recently, dry. To me it stands for do repeat yourself. On the web you must repeat yourself. Take a, an extremely simple example. We have a product page, and on the product page you show, I don't know, 12 products, and when the user scrolls down, or when he pr uh, presses a button, you just fire up a little Ajax script that loads 12 more products, right? Completely normal. Still, you also have to make sure that that is accessible without JavaScript. For instance, by making the button the user presses actually a link that links to the next product page. And that's, by the way, that's not because people disable JavaScript. They don't. It's because the JavaScript may be delayed because they're on a crappy mobile network. That's what it's all about. In any case, this forces us to write the uh, same functionality twice in a certain respect. Because you've got one bit of data, the new product, and you show it in one way and then in another way, and both are actually necessary for your site. Now, I, when I published it, I got some pushback. Somebody said, yeah, but you know, an experienced engineer knows when he uh, or she has to uh, forget about this uh, sort of stuff and repeat themselves anyway. And that's true. If you are su sufficiently experienced, you can probably get away with uh, breaking a lot of rules in specific situations where it's necessary. But it's not exactly what I mean. Uh, my point here is that repeating yourself is fundamental to how the web works. Repeating yourself is absolutely necessary if you want your website to work on more than just the two or three latest browsers. Um, 
To my way of thinking, uh, this is something that students of web development should learn as soon as possible. Please repeat yourself. Of course, in an orderly fashion, and only when it's actually necessary, but yes, you will have to repeat yourself as a web developer. Um, I think that not all software engineering principles make sense on the web. A lot of them will, but not all. The problem is um, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not a, a software engineer with a formal uh, education. Instead, I studied the later Roman Empire when they did not have computers yet. So I'm still looking for ways of defining, OK, what's actually going on here? But the fundamental thing here is the web is not one platform. That forces us to repeat ourselves. And it may also force us to reject certain other software engineering principles. I'm not sure yet. Final detour, it's time for experience focus. And what do I mean by that? Um, 20 years ago, uh, Jared Spool, uh, a well-known uh, UX and uh, UI consultant in the US, um, created a software market maturity model um, that was uh, meant to give uh, soft, uh, software development companies um, an insight in what their users expected from them. And I would like to uh, try his theory on web development. And if I talk about users of the software, I mean us web developers and not the visitors of our site. So we web developers initially went into the technology focus, which basically means, OK, this piece of software does something that has never been done before. And that in itself, in itself makes it very valuable. I mean, you've all had that, right? You made your first website. With trembling hands, you uploaded it to your server, and then you checked it in your browser. And you thought, anyone in the world can see this now. Mind-blowing, at least it was to me. Maybe it's uh, different for you, but it was to me. And that is the technology focus. Wow, this works. Incredible. But, you know, the novelty wears off pretty quickly. And um, uh, we move on to the feature focus stage, where uh, we basically concentrate on the features that our users want. And, of course, then we get back to the layer tag, which was a first attempt at a feature focus phase. Right? We think web developers will like this, so we're going to implement it in our browser, while Microsoft thought something slightly different and implemented that in their browser. They, um, they competed with one another on feature level. Eventually, uh, Jared Spool's model says, all uh, pieces of software support roughly the same features, and the few features that are not supported uh, are uh, basically not that important to most of our uh, users. And then it's time for the experience focus stage, where you can concentrate on the experience the users get when using this software. And you may understand what I'm going to say next. We have been stuck in the feature focus phase for far too long as web developers. We should move on to the experience focus stage, where we concentrate on improving the overall experience of creating websites. Now, what does that mean? I have absolutely no clue. I just plain don't know. I do know, however, that we have to stop focusing on features, features, features. So, in this presentation, we saw that we acquired quite a few habits along the way in our checkered history of web development. I also think that the only really, really good habit we picked up is responsive design. Using tools, Looking inward into our own ecosystem, it has its good parts, it has its bad parts. The rest is bad only. Um, that finishes up my presentation. Um, again, there is not a strong conclusion here. There's more something like, please think about this stuff, because it's worth thinking about, because we are stuck now as web developers, I think. Too many features, not enough ideas. Thank you. So, I got a little bit sentimental by seeing Dynamic Drive. Yeah, dynamic it was also drive. a lot of fun, right? <laughs> it was, it was. I, I, I once tried to understand the library, though, and I didn't really. No, it was, it was, uh, it was anarchistic, maybe. Uh, yes, and there was also uh, something that it downloaded one file for Netscape and one file for IE. When I look, looked at that, I thought, is this really a good idea? It was kind of a proto-dependency or something. Yeah. I don't know. 
it was fun. I enjoyed it too a lot, so yeah. poking around with stuff like that. Um, again, a lot of questions, so I'll see what, I, what I'm capable of asking for you. Uh, one is from, uh, from Joaf, who just did his keynote. He says, um, you say browsers are an intermediate layer and therefore web is inferior to, uh, to native apps. I did not but, say inferior. Okay. Can, it's, can that layer not be fast enough? The like the, um, I think he means like, you say browser are an intermediate layer and can that layer not be fast enough so you still have um, the same experience? It can be, fa uh, it, no, I don't think so. Because uh, it's an intermediate layer. So it has to receive an instruction from the JavaScript and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, you want me to scroll? Yes, I will scroll. Uh, dear operating system, please scroll for me. It yeah. just takes a little longer. And so I mean, it will be only milliseconds, maybe only microseconds, but there will be a slight lag. But in that case, you're trying to keep up with, let's say, uh, Xcode and, and iOS and their uh, native apps that are programs, and that they are always ahead. That's your point. Um, when you go for pure UX, for pure user experience, if yeah. that is the most important thing for whatever you want to create, go native. Yeah. But in most other cases, the web is at least worth looking at because yeah. the web has three things over native. One, it's simplicity two URLs, and three, it's reach. I mean, there's only one single thing that everybody on the planet, well, say six out of seven billion people on the planet can understand, but that's a website yeah. because of this, because of the mobile phone they have in their pocket. Yeah. And uh, Jake Archibald, I don't think he's here, but he, no, he's not he, here. He, uh, he did reply on this, and he said, like, C++ is also, this is a bit complicated, but, but mm. I can, C++ is an intermediate, la intermediate layer as well. Uh, why, aren't we all, why aren't we all writing assembly? And I think what he means is, like, we put these layers on top of code to mm -hmm. make it more accessible, to, to be able to process it. Isn't there some truth in, in that you need abstraction layers to, to be able to develop? Oh, yes, oh, oh, yeah. absolutely. I'm yeah. not saying we don't need abstraction layers. Yeah. I'm just saying web apps need one extra abstraction layer, yeah. which is going to make it slightly slower. Yeah. And for example, with frameworks, do you, do you, do you think you still should use them, but like f in, a, in a certain way or? Um, I'm mostly asking people to think about how they're using frameworks right. and to maybe think, hmm, I've always used these three frameworks, but might it be time to just leave out one of them? Or maybe, maybe even leave out two of them. I mean, um, frameworks are now regarded as something you should use, period. Maybe sometimes it's even the whole point of creating a website. No, not the whole point, but it's, it's become too important in our minds, okay. the whole frame, yeah. uh, framework and tooling thing. Okay, I want to thank you very much for your thank talk you. and give me a big applause.